When you have a circuit with the battery and the resistor, all the forces from the battery get concentrated in the resistor because of which the potential difference across the battery stays the same as that across the resistor. Something we saw in our previous video. What I wanna talk about in this video is how does that happen? How does the battery know exactly where the resistor is to make sure all the forces get concentrated over there? Why does the wire experience no force? How does it all like, how does it all happen automatically? Imagine there was a switch and we just closed it. There is a small period of time, very temporary stage called the transient stage of the circuit, during which all of these are happening and we'll basically talk about what happens during this stage. So imagine we've just closed the switch and the current hasn't had any time to start yet, all right? Let's analyze what would be the forces on the electrons to begin with, okay? Well, because the electrons are gonna get pushed away from the negative terminal and get pulled towards the positive terminal, all the electrons are gonna experience a force in this direction, and turns out all these forces are going to be exactly the same. Even the electrons closer to the battery and farther away are going to experience the same force. At this point, you might say, Mohesh, that's not very scientific. Why should I take your word for it? It doesn't make any sense because you would expect electrons closer to the battery to actually get more experience and more force compared to the electrons farther away. How does that happen? We'll talk about that towards the later half of this video as to some, there's something else that happens which I'm skipping over as of now so we can get to the main point. Um, and if you think about it, you might also question if you're curious like why does the forces are, why are the forces along the wire, right? Like how does the battery know in what direction the wire is, how the wire is so that to make sure the forces are along the wire. Again, all of that happens um, automatically and we'll talk about that in the later half. But let's start with that. So all the electrons are experiencing exactly the same force to begin with, the current has not yet started. My question to you would be, um, what would be the consequence of this? Um, think about the current in the wire, where there's no resistance, and the current in the resistor, where there is high resistance. Do you think the current is gonna be the same? Current is gonna be more somewhere, less somewhere? Can you pause and think about that? All right, let's start by looking at what happens inside a resistor. So if I zoom into a resistor, we can imagine that a resistor has a lot of obstacles in it. So the electrons can't just move through it in straight lines. So when an electron tries to make through it, when you push the electrons and try to make through it, these electrons will end up moving in this random zigzaggy pattern where they keep bumping into the atoms over and over again. And so they don't get very far very quickly. So instead what's gonna happen is that because of this random motion, they're gonna slowly and steadily keep moving forward due to these forces, all right? Now, what would have happened if there was more resistance, more bumping, and they would move forward even slowly? What happens if there's less resistance? Well, they would move forward much quicker. So if you use the same model for over here and in the wires where there's hardly any resistance, almost no resistance, or you can say zero resistance to begin with, then we can see that the electrons inside the wire will just move with incredibly high speeds, but the electrons inside the resistor will move with very low speeds. And that can help us understand that the current in the rest of the wire should be incredibly high. And we'll end up with very low current in the resistor. And what about in the battery? We're gonna assume the battery also does not have any resistance in it, again, just to keep things very simple. And so the way a battery works is for every electron that moves away and that comes in, battery, remember, has a chemical, chemical forces are acting which are pushing the electrons back. And we're gonna assume that the battery is able to just push it at whatever speed it wants. And so the current inside the battery is also going to be very high, but in, of course, in reality, it's not gonna be the case. And so right in front of your eyes, you see that the current everywhere does not begin to be the same everywhere, right? I mean, the current starts with what you expect intuitively. Very high current in the parts where there is low resistance and very low current in the parts where there is high resistance. What's gonna happen because of this? Like how does that eventually translate into, how do we finally get the same current everywhere? But let's look at a consequence of this. Let's look at, at this point, the point of entrance of the resistor. You have a lot of electrons coming in per second. So maybe 100 or 200 electrons coming in per second as an example. But because there's a lot of resistance over here, the amount of electrons that are going into the resistor, like they're moving across the resistor will be very low, so maybe say one or two electrons per second. So what's gonna happen if 100 move in, 100 are moving in per second, but only one or two can like move through, there's gonna be charge accumulation that happens at this point, right? So there's going to be some electrons accumulated over there. So you'll have some negative charge being accumulated at that point because of the electron accumulation. 
And the same thing's gonna happen over here on the other end of the resistor. More electrons are moving out per second, but the amount of electrons moving into this point per second will be very low. And so there'll be deficiency of electrons. And there, therefore there'll be a positive charge accumulation that's happening over here. So that starts happening. So there's a negative charge accumulation. There is a positive charge accumulation that starts happening. And now I want you to think about what is the effect of these charge accumulations on the current outside the resistor and on the current inside the resistor. Think about the forces that they will start putting on the electrons on the wire here and on the electrons inside. Can you pause and think about that? Because now there's a negative charge, can you imagine that there's going to be um, a backward push acting on these electrons over here? Can you see that? Similarly, because there's a positive charge, there's going to be a backward pull acting on these electrons over here. So you can see the net force on the electrons starts reducing. It's happening, it's happening, okay? As a result, what do you think will happen to the current through these, the, the current through the rest of the wire? Well, that's going to start reducing. What's gonna happen to the forces on the electrons inside the wire because of this charge accumulation? Well, you can see that the negative charge is going to push the electron, the positive is gonna pull the electron in the same direction, in the same direction. As a result, the forces inside the resistor start increasing. Can you see it happening? So the charge accumulation is the main culprit for why this happens. So the current inside the resistor starts increasing because the push starts increasing. Now, what's going to happen as a result of that? Well, as long as the current outside is more than the current inside the resistor, the charge accumulation continues, right? You'll keep getting more and more charges getting accumulated over here. And as more and more charge gets accumulated, this effect continues. The net force on the electrons outside will keep on reducing and the current outside will keep reducing. The current inside will keep increasing. Eventually they will reach a state where the two currents will exactly match. That eventually has to happen because until that happens, charge accumulation will just keep on increasing, keep on increasing. And when that has happened, finally we have the electrons entering into the resistor equal to the electrons moving across the resistor. And finally the charge accumulation stops, stays there. It doesn't increase anymore. It's there, it stays there. And at that point, I have the current to be the same everywhere in the circuit. The current is no longer changing in my circuit. And at that point, I know for sure that the net force on the electrons would have reduced to zero. Because if the net force had not reduced to zero, then the electrons would sort of like keep accelerating and the current would keep increasing because there's absolutely no resistance. But we know the electrons are not accelerating, the electrons are not moving, the current is the same, the current is not changing. So net force becomes zero here and you have a very high force inside the resistor, all the forces got concentrated. So if I could just summarize, to begin with, when we just close the switch, the forces were same everywhere. As a result, there was more current here, very high current in the wire, very low current in the resistor. But because of that, charge accumulation started, and that charge accumulation made sure that the forces outside the wire reduced, the forces inside the re resistor increased. That made sure that the current inside the wire reduced and the current inside the resistor increased. And this keeps happening. More and more charge gets accumulated, reducing the forces outside, making sure that the current tries to become more and more equal. And eventually, when enough charges have accumulated and all the forces outside has disappeared, the two currents become exactly equal to each other. We have reached our steady state. So the culprit is the charge accumulation that happens across the resistor, which most of the times we don't talk about because that happens during the temporary transient state. Now let's come to the question, how did we know that the electrons experience exactly the same force the moment I closed the switch? To do that, to analyze this deeply, let's start by looking at our battery a little bit more closely. So I'm gonna ignore everything else. Imagine the situation when we just manufactured our battery. We didn't have any positive or negative terminal to begin with actually, right? Just made our battery. What's gonna happen at the core, at the heart of the battery is there are chemicals that are gonna push the electrons in a specific direction from one particular electrode to another. In our example, let's say we push the electrons upwards, all right? Now this push will be there 
all the time, whether a battery is connected in a circuit or not, because a battery doesn't know when it is connected to a circuit or not. So this push is always there. But when the battery is not connected to the circuit, the electrons don't have anywhere to go. There are electrons, free electrons inside, but they don't have anywhere to go. So what's gonna happen? Well, they're gonna get piled up on one end of the battery. And as a result, there will be a negative charge. So let me just draw a negative charge, okay? So there's gonna be a negative charge that gets piled up on one end of the battery. And when there is a negative charge that gets piled up over here, that it leaves behind positive charges and more electrons can swoop in. And eventually, as a result, there'll be a positive charge that gets piled up on the other end of the battery. Now, because of this negative and positive charges, when I look at any specific electron inside the battery, now you can see along with the chemical force that's trying to push it up to the negative side, there will also be an electric push that tries to push it back down. You can see that. And as long as the chemical push is stronger than the electric push, the pile keeps on increasing. And as the pile keeps on increasing, this electric push becomes stronger and stronger. And eventually, the, both the electric push and the chemical push becomes exactly equal. And that's when things stop. That's when the, the piling up stops, the piling up stays a constant. And now we have your battery. We have your battery with a negative terminal on one side and you have the positive terminal on the other side. The chemical push is always there, it's just now balanced. What would happen if I got rid of, you know, if I removed one of this electron and I added it back, the pile would reduce, the electric push would reduce a little bit, the chemical push would be stronger and the electrons would again get pumped. So you can sort of kind of see the battery will sort of always try to maintain that pile, maintain that negative and the positive charge. So this is your battery right now, all right? Okay, now I'm gonna connect it to our circuit. What's going to happen? Well, first of all, before anything starts moving, these negative and positive charges will start pushing on these electrons. Let's start by looking at these forces a little bit more detail. Okay, what direction will those forces be? These forces will have nothing to do with the way the wire is. The forces between two charges are dictated by Coulomb's law, which basically says that the force is along the line joining, all right? So I'm just gonna ignore the wire for now because it has nothing to do with the forces, at least to begin with. So how would we analyze the forces? Let's say on this charge, we would say the negative pile will push it away along the line joining. The positive pile will pull it, but that because the positive pile is farther away, the pull will be much smaller, and so the net force would still be in this direction. But what about, say, this electron over here? What will be the direction of the force over there? Well, again, the negative charge will sort of like, you, it'll push it this way with a little smaller force because it's farther away. The positive charge would actually pull it, maybe in this direction, even smaller, and then I have to add up those forces and then maybe eventually I figure out that the net force is actually somewhat, I don't know, maybe the net force is actually somewhat this way or something like that. And that's what I have to do for every single electron. Now there's a neat way in which we can actually do it much faster by introducing the idea of electric fields. So let me just quickly, if you haven't heard of electric field, let me just quickly tell you how super useful it's going to be. Electric fields is a way to visualize how charges would put forces on anything that's out there in space. So let me just tell you what the electric fields of a battery would look like. The electric field would look somewhat like this. It might look a little intimidating, but what it basically says is that if I want to know what would be the char force on any charge kept over there, it basically says the force will be tangential to this particular line. So if there's a charge over here, the force will be in this direction. If there's a charge over here, the force will be in this direction. And of course, the direction represents the direction in which a positive charge would experience a force because positive charge gets all the credits and all the attention in the electricity world, which is bad for electrons. But anyways, if I know that positive charge experience a force this way, the, elect the electrons would just experience a force in the opposite direction. So it's, uh, the electric field is a beautiful way, it's a beautiful tool to visualize in what direction the forces would be, and we're gonna use that. Um, but that's not just it. It also tells me about, it's not just the direction, it also tells me about the strength of the force. And the way it tells it, it's not so straightforward, but the way it tells it is, if you are in a region where the electric field lines are very close to each other, then you imagine that the force is going to be stronger. If they consider the places where the electric field lines are far away, the force is weaker. So I know that the electric field lines are farther away, so the forces over here would be smaller, the forces over here would be stronger, and that kind of makes sense. Closer to the battery, you'd expect a stronger force. Farther away, you'd expect a weaker force. So now what we're gonna do is, we'll use this. So let me just delete this stuff. We'll use this, and let me just like dim it a little bit. 
and try to think about the direction of the forces on these electrons. And so you can see the force over here on the electron will not be downward, it'll be opposite direction because it's a negative charge, so it's in the opposite direction. It'll be negative, opposite this way. The force on this will be opposite this way. And so if I map all of that out, here is what we would get. This is how the forces would look like. You can see that these forces are all along the field lines, they're tangential to the field lines. I didn't draw a field line over here, I couldn't draw it, but if you did, you would see that the forces would be in that way. So this is how the forces would be, and as you fall farther away, the forces would actually become smaller. That makes sense. So now that we have understood what the forces are going to be, let me get rid of the field, let me bring back our, <clears throat> our circuit, and you can see the forces are just in random direction. How did we go from there to forces being parallel to the wire? How does that happen? For that, let's look at it even more closer. Oh man, this is getting super, super interesting. All right, so if I were to zoom into a section of this wire, let's say this is, I'm zooming into this section of the wire. Let's look at the consequence of this force. What's, what's this force going to do? So we have an electron over here, and that's experiencing a force in this direction. What I can do is I can decompose that force into two components, right? I can say that there is one component of the force this way, and there's another component of the force this way. We're gonna use mechanics left and right here, okay? So there's gonna be one component of the force which is in the forward direction, one component of the force that's going to be acting upwards, all right? And the forward component of the, course we, of, of the force we know what's gonna do, it's gonna try and push the electrons and it's gonna make our current. But what's going to, what will be the perpendicular component going to do? Well, it's also trying to go to push the electrons, but the electrons don't have anywhere to go. So they're gonna ram into the surface of our conductor. So you can imagine it's like a pipe and just like it just ramps into it. And as a result, this electron gets accumulated over here. And of course we have not one electron, we have a lot of electrons. So all of these electrons will get accumulated over here on the top. And because it's a conductor, electrons can freely move. Electrons will never be like localized in one point. Whenever you have electrons concentration in one point, it sort of like moves, all these electrons move away from each other because they are repelled by each other. And eventually they will redistribute themselves over the entire surface of this entire conductor. You can imagine that this is the electrons on the back surface of the conductor and so they'll redistribute themselves in such a way that this force gets canceled out. Now you may ask like, how do you know that's gonna happen? Well, think about it. Until that force, perpendicular force gets canceled out, more and more electrons will get distributed, right? And so that distribution will keep on happening until eventually it should stop sometime, right? It will stop in, when they have configured in such a way, they may not get uni <coughs> uniformly distributed, they get distributed in such a way that they have killed the perpendicular force. That's how the distribution of charges on the surface of the wire will ensure that the net force on this electron will be in the forward direction. The same thing will happen to every single electron. In fact, <coughs> at every single piece of the wire. Now a quick question for you is, I want you to think about where do you think this negative surface charge deposition would be higher, closer to the negative terminal or farther away from the negative terminal? Where do you think will it be higher? Can you pause and think about it? Well, it would be higher wherever this component of the force would be larger and Closer to the battery, the force itself is larger. So even the paddle, the perpendicular component is going to be larger, which means closer to the battery, we would expect a lot of these electron depositions. But as you go farther and farther away from this battery, the electron depositions will become just smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay, what's gonna happen on this side? To answer that question, I'm gonna ask you, where did these electrons come from? Well, you could say that those were the free electrons which are already there inside the conductor. But as these free electrons deposit on the surface, they're gonna leave behind a positive charge, right? That positive charge is gonna start attracting more electrons. And you know which electrons it'll attract? This pile of electrons that is, has been desperately waiting to go away from the battery. So in, 
in some sense, you can see that these electrons actually came from the battery's pile that was over here. But as this pile becomes smaller, we've already seen that the battery will start pumping more electrons from here to here. Where does our battery get electrons here to begin with? Oh, it's gonna start sucking the electrons from all over here. And it's gonna have the exact same effect as that we had over here, just that instead of getting a negative charge on the surface of the wire, you're gonna end up with a positive charge on the surface of the wire. And again, the positive charge will distribute itself in such a way that the perpendicular component will go away because if it didn't go away, the electrons would still be moving perpendicular to the wire, would, getting, get, would be getting rammed into the wire. <coughs> Same argument. And so you can see in a sense, it's the electrons from here went over here actually. And so all the charges should be balanced, right? And the same idea, as you go farther and farther away from the battery, the positive charges would just reduce because the effect of the force would reduce. And eventually, there must be a point somewhere over here where there are no charges because you go from negative to positive. So it's really the charges on the surface of the wire that ensure that the forces are all parallel to the wire. But the last thing is, I also said that the forces are going to be exactly equal everywhere before the current starts, okay? This is just before that. How does that happen? Like, how does that how, how does that make sense? Because, you know, my intuition would say that electrons would experience stronger force closer to the battery compared to farther away, and that's exactly what's drawn over here as well. Well, that was true earlier, but now, because of the surface charges, things are gonna get complicated. I mean, a single electron is now experiencing a force due to all these charges, okay? So it feels like it's hopelessly impossible to try and analyze you know, what the forces would be. So, you know, it makes, I'm sure it makes you curious as to how can I make such a bold statement <laughs> that, you know, the forces are same everywhere. This is where we're going to use one of Maxwell's equations called Gauss's law. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about it, but it's a very powerful law that we can use in such hopelessly complicated situations. And we can look at some of the elegant things um, and, and actually make such some conclusions. Okay, um, now before I even go to that, Let's go back and look at how the electric field was. Remember that the electric field of, electric field due to the battery was this way to begin with. This, is, this was before the charge redistribution that happened on the surface, right? What would the electric field look like now? Can you pause and think about it? At least inside the wire, that's all we are interested in. We know the forces, and we know the electric field is basically an indication of force, so can you visualize how the electric field would be? Well, because I know the forces is parallel to the wire, the electric field now inside the wire should also be parallel to the wire. And if you consider a circuit like this, it's gonna be all nice and straight. And the question in front of us is, can we comment on the strength of this electric field everywhere, right? If I can prove that the electric field everywhere is the same, I'm done, because then I know the forces are going to be the same. But how can I comment on that? How can I know how can I come, like how can I compare electric field at two points when I have such a complicated situation? And this is where Gauss's law comes in. So what does Gauss's law say? So let me just give you a refresher first. Gauss's law says that if I take any random closed surface, that's important, you need to have a closed surface. And if you have some electric field everywhere, then Gauss's law says that if you find out, if you calculate what the perpendicular component of that electric field is at any point, you multiply it by the area at that small point. So you take the perpendicular component of the electric field at a point and you multiply it by the area at that point. And when I say at that point, you can imagine a very small area. And you do that over the entire surface and add it up. So you basically do a summation of this. This will always be equal to, now it looks like a very complicated mess, but this will always be equal to the total charge that is the net charge that is inside the surface divided by epsilon naught, okay? If you're not familiar with this, I have some Khan Academy videos in which I have explained this in great detail, but this is basically the law which we're going to use to actually convince ourselves that the field is the same, all right? Last piece of the puzzle, ready for this? Let's do it. So. How can I use this? I'm gonna zoom into one of this section of the wire. And this is what the electric field looks like over there. What I'm gonna do is 
I'm gonna invoke Gauss's law. And for that, I'm gonna choose a closed surface. I'm free to choose any closed surface I want. And the idea is to choose a closed surface that actually is to your advantage. So I'm gonna choose a closed surface that's pretty similar to a wire. It's gonna be like a cylinder that has been bent. It's gonna have the same area everywhere. It's gonna be slightly smaller than the wire. So it's inside the wire, okay? And now I'm going to calculate this sum, which by the way is called flux. This is called the electric flux, okay, technicalities. Okay, let me calculate that for this entire closed cylinder that I've chosen. First of all, can you see that because electric field is parallel over here, there is no perpendicular component. Over here, electrical perpendicular component does not exist. So there are no electrical comp perpendicular components ev anywhere on the lateral surface of the cylinder. So only the front and the back surface is where the perpendicular component exists. So here, the entire electric field is perpendicular to my area. So let's call that electric field as E1. And let's call that A area as basically A. Then over here, if I were to do that summation, what will I get? I'm just gonna put that. We'll get E1A, E1A plus, over here, everywhere else it's zero, so I'm not gonna add it. And the only other piece I have to add is this part. Over here, the electric field is inwards. So whenever the electric field is inwards, you, you know, let's, let's say I don't know what the electric field is. I'm gonna call that electric field as E2. But the area is gonna be the same. I notice the entire electric field is again perpendicular. All right, so that's my left-hand side because I have done the summation. There are nowhere else electric field exists. What would this equal to? Charge inside divided by epsilon naught. What is the charge inside the cylinder? You might say, well, hey, how do I know what's the charge inside the cylinder? Well, let's see. First of all, notice that none of these surface charges are going to be a problem for us because they are not inside the cylinder. The surface charges are outside. Gauss law only cares about the charges inside the surface. That's the beauty of it. Inside, I have these free electrons which are ready to flow, which are not charged yet. Remember, this is the initial temporary stage. But for every conduction electron, I have a proton. All right, so that nullifies the charge. In other words, I have no net charge. There is no net charge over here, if you think about it. So this is zero. What does that mean? That means E1 and E2 should be same in magnitude. Um, right? Only that can be zero. And one will be the negative of the other. It's basically saying in one, one place, the electric field should be inwards and the other place, the electric field should be outwards but you can see that they have to be same in the magnitude. And I can do that for any two points. I can just draw a closed cylinder like this and I can convince ourselves that the electric field should be the same. Now you might say, Mahesh, no, no, I don't, this, like you use some equation. I don't buy this. Like what the hell is this? Give me some intuition for it. Unfortunately, it's a little hard to provide intuition, but let me try anyways. You can think of electric flux as a flow or just like a flow of water. Not the electric field, but you, Flux, flux is you take electric field multiplied by the area, that's like the flow of water. Now, what this equation is basically saying is that if I have a closed surface and I find out that um, there is some net flow outwards, so if I find out that this, this value is positive, that means there is a net flow outwards, then there should be some source of water inside. And that makes sense. If there is some water coming out, the water should be coming out from somewhere, correct? But what if that number is zero? What if, um, or, or think of it this way, what if there is no source of water inside that surface? If that doesn't exist, then whatever water enters into the surface, that exact same amount of water should exit. There is no other way around it because if some water entered and more water exited, that means there is a source. If more water entered, less water exited, there must be a sink. And, and, and therefore, either you need a source or a sink, only then the flux can exist. Otherwise, net flux will be zero. And that's the same principle over here that you know within the wire, I don't have any charges. And so the electric flux at two points need to be the same. You might say, if you're very, very curious, and this is the last, last, last part, you might say, this is only true because you chose cleverly, Mahesh, you chose the cross-sectional area to be the same. And someone commented about that in my, one of my previous videos. I'm, I'm so sorry, I don't remember your name right now when I'm recording, but thanks to you that you, you commented on the cross-sectional area. True, I, I chose uh, you know the cross-sectional area to be the same, just to, just to keep it simple. But you might say, Mahesh, what if the cross-sectional area was not the same? So for example, what if the cross-sectional area was somewhat like this, where you had 
very thick wire over here. Now, things wouldn't be the same. Now would the electric field be the same? The answer is no. In fact, if this is twice the area as this and you use this equation, you will actually find the electric field over here will be twice as much compared, sorry, you'll have the electric field over here will be half as much compared to the electric field over here because this product will should be the same, right? So you'll have half the electric field here compared to over here and that's still fine because if you have half the electric field, charges over here will move with half the speed with the charges over here, but you have twice the amount of charges because you have a thicker wire. So it all works out and, and make sure that the current stays the same. So anyways, long story short, what we see is that the moment we close the switch, initially, all the electrons will have a force that is dictated by this battery field that we showed earlier. But then quickly the perpendicular component of the forces cancel out due to the charge redistribution. That charge redistribution also ensures that the forces on every single electron happens becomes the same by using Gauss's law. And then because the, the forces are the same, the current in the wire which has no resistance is incredibly high compared to the current in the resistor. And then eventually there'll be charge built up at the ends of the resistor and the electric force in the wire, rest of the wire reduces and the electric force in the, in the resistor increases and that equalizes the current everywhere. And the potential difference across the battery becomes the same as the potential difference across the resistor. If you're still here through my entire, I don't know what, 30, 35 minutes of rant, kudos to you, let me know if you think I should make such more deep dive videos because I'm super interested in doing that. I just don't know if you folks are interested in watching like 35, 40 minutes long um, um, lectures, lecture type videos, but I do have a lot of ideas. Uh, for example, I can give you a sneak peek. Um, no, never mind. I'll not do that. Bye.